think for it, but it just says, oh, there we go. Now it's happening. All right. Yeah, it's it's live. Yes, I'm recording. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> I think I found a, I don't know if that's the main Zoom that I posted in there, but I did find a link. Anyway, we'll see. So Brandon, are you all set then? I'm all set. I don't know about Andy and all the other blind people that are trying to get in. I'm I'm here. Oh, okay, and good. This is Andy. Right. Sorry, yeah, I'm here. I made it in. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the breakout session A4 for non-visual access to immersive environments. Uh, um, I want to take a quick moment to introduce myself. I'm Stephanie Montgomery. I'm the Vice President of Research and Best Practices here at the XR Association, where we have an accessibility working group, and probably most of you are familiar with the work we published regarding a developer's guide for accessibility and have subsequently been diving into exploring the uh, accessibility object model and potentially prototyping something out. Um, and then I also want to introduce the two real stars of this show, uh, uh, Thomas Logan, who is the founder and CEO of Equal Entry. Their mission is contributing to a more accessible world. To achieve this for clients, they do training, education, auditing, and accessibility on websites, desktops, mobile games, apps, virtual reality, and they help companies build digital technologies. With all that going on, he still manages to organize the accessible virtual reality, and he's the co-organizer of the Accessibility New York, which are monthly meetups for people who are interested in uh, accessibility. And he leaves, lives in Tokyo, where I'm sure he can't get a good taco, but in Korea, I know you can get a good taco. So that's a good place to be. Um, and then Roland Dubois, who's with Shopware and the School of Visual Arts, and he does a little bit of everything. He has judged uh, UX and UI thesis presentations. He co-founded a, a development company, and he's monitor. He's been a mentor at the MIT Reality Hack. And he's also written a book in German, walk doing a, a like a tour through Italy, following the path of German Romantic painters. Uh, he is currently the Extra Accessibility Advisor at Virtual Leap and um, a Mozilla Tech speaker and the creator of GRAVR which is a globally recognized avatar for VR on the web. Um, and he lives in New York City, where you can also get a pretty decent taco, I'm sure. You sure can. <laughs> so that, let's uh, start us off. Thomas Roland, which one do you want to take the lead? Um, I'd like to start, but uh, I guess I'm having this you know, anxiety here, so I can't share anything into the room for slides. Is there any way to make me a co-host to share? screen if not i'm also very good at okay. i think i'm good at audio description of some slides so i can just do it that way roland do you have screen share ability? Oh, now I have it. Okay. Okay. Oh. Here we go. All no right. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So I'm going to jump down. We're going to dive right in um, into this presentation. And, you know, really the goal for us today is to mostly be able to uh, fa facilitate a conversation with everyone um, about this topic. Um, I wanted to start, uh, I'm going to try to keep this pretty tight to about like, 15, 20 minutes just to introduce you to some of the work uh, that's been going on in our uh, working group, the accessible development in XR at uh, XR Access Group. And our area we've been focusing on has been on exploring how do we think about creating text alternatives in uh, XR and for objects and you know interfaces. So we're going to start with the web has alt text, but what does VR have? And right here, we're going right into a screenshot example of, uh, as mentioned uh, by Stephanie in the uh, intro here, uh, myself, uh, I run a meetup every month uh, with Merrill Evans, who's also here with us in the group, uh, Accessibility Virtual Reality. And we host events every month in Mozilla Hubs, and we're always trying to be accessible. One of the first things that we see inside of Mozilla Hubs is we invite people to come join us 
for the presentation. And uh, this is something that would affect everyone. It doesn't just affect you know people who are blind and low vision, but when you come into the room, there's the ability to share slides into the room. There's the ability to share, uh, you know, a web camera into the room. And when these objects get shared into the room in Mozilla Hubs, they basically have these names like reticulum.io 4C43 and reticulum.io 30A7. Not very helpful, right, to figure out which one of those is the presentation slides. And so inside of the virtual room, for people who uh, have vision and want to see a magnified view of the slides, you know, it'd be really nice if you could say, uh, in the objects list in Mozilla Hubs, hover over the slides object. And that's what you would pick up. But right now, because we don't have well-named objects in the room, we have to say, pick the second item in the list of objects or pick the third item in the list of objects. And basically this comes from the idea that there is no labeling of objects in this virtual world. And also just to step back a, a moment, Mozilla Hubs is a WebXR based platform. So this is something that's built that people can join from a laptop or mobile phone, or you can also join inside of a virtual reality headset. And so again, I, I started with this uh, slide just to say that this idea right here for adding alt text to an object, it's really a barrier for everyone that uses the platform because you know, pretty much everyone that comes to our meetup, they're like, well, I wanna see the slides in a larger format and they have no way to know without the objects being labeled. Um, here, I'm showing this <laughs> quick example. This is an example of the moon and it's a slow rotation, but to try to show 3D is very hard to show in a 2D presentation platform like uh, Zoom, but the idea being that one of the challenges with 3D objects is that depending on what side of the object you're looking at, there may need to be you know, different alternative text descriptions for an object. And so I uh, just chose the moon as an example, but uh, we'll have some other examples and, and, and definitely things we want to get into in the Q&A part of the discussions here is that um, I like to keep things simple and say, well, we need to at least have alt text uh, for objects in XR, but we also have to consider the idea that in XR, uh, objects have the ability to be rotated and manipulated, and you're not always looking, two people can be looking at different sides of the object for example. So, and those sides may have different alt text that's appropriate. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Owen Wang, who was a software engineer intern that we had at my company Equal Entry. Uh, he worked with us to build a customized version of Mozilla Hubs. And that's something that we won't have for today's breakout, but you know, meeting you all today, and we're happy to have so many people here with us today in this breakout room. Uh, we would love to follow up with you in working in our customized hub where we did add the ability to add basically descriptions and then, or alt text, I guess you could say to an object and custom information to an object. Uh, so how we did that is we added, uh, Owen added a custom describe button to objects that exist in Mozilla hubs. And that at least gave us the capability to label objects uh, inside of it. Um, giving another example of a Shiba Inu, as mentioned, I live in Tokyo, so I like Shiba Inu dogs. Um, but so this is one of the uh, examples I wanted to give of a pulling objects from a 3D asset store. It's the same way of like searching for Google images for an image or PowerPoint images as a search function. Um, if we type in that we're looking for a dog, on Sketchfab, which is a popular 3D asset store, we can find objects like this Shiba. And um, this is showing that these objects do have names. They do have labels when you search for them on hosting platforms for 3D objects. And we want, wanted to put forward that when you take an object from a 3D platform asset store and pull it into your world, it should still keep at least at a minimum the same label of what it has on the store. And so this is a good example of without any customization to hubs, 
um, even though it's labeled Shiba on the asset store on Sketchfab, when you pull it into hubs, by default, it just gets a label like reticulum dot 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 a zero seven f. And we want the default at least to start with the author that loaded it into the asset store on Sketchfab, for example. We should at least start from that. Um, so that's what we did in our project was that we were able to get the default labels that you get on uh, Sketchfab to come through. So in this screenshot, I'm showing that now this object's been pulled into Mozilla Hubs and the object has a name of Shiba. Uh, also, I'm not sure how many people on the call are familiar with accessible rich internet applications, the ARIA specification, but this specification has the idea of providing name, role, and value. So we put a hypothetical role here of 3D model, um, but this is also open for discussion, but it, we think you know it's conceptually trying to build off of what's already been done on the web uh, going into XR, I think is a good thing. So we tried to model that in this demonstration to say we have uh, basically an ARIA name and a role attribute or an ARIA dash label and a role attribute. Then we also added this idea, and again, this is where we really want to get feedback for, I think, a lot of the conversations in today's talk. Um, you know, we could have name is Shiba, and in Aria, we have this description attribute that could be something like tan, colored, fluffy, puppy. Uh, Roland, do you want to talk about some of the other ideas on, like, what could be put into description or custom fields for uh, 3D objects? Yes. <clears throat> so yeah. when bringing in 3D objects into a virtual environment, especially in a shared environment, the um, one of the major uh, thoughts that came to mind were like, what's the reason why you're bringing that object into the space? Um, is it a tool to communicate, to present, to interact with? Is it um, something that demonstrate certain things uh, so we we thought like not only the meta description um like in in the concept of a 2d web where you have an alt text that replaces a flat image a three-dimensional object in a virtual space takes up space and volume so i'm thinking that the most important factors not only a description a visual description but also a volume description um, not only a directional description from top, bottom, left, right, but also um, is that an item that responds to interaction? Uh, is that an item that uh, you can interact with, you can collide with, you will have to uh, surround, uh, like walk around it, you can go through it. Um, there's, because in a virtual environment, you're very much navigating a space, it's important to label things and describe things based on what kind of weight they have, physicality, uh, what kind of interaction, uh, like if, a texture, um, are they soft, are they hard? Um, and um, how, how do they uh, fit in the context of what I'm trying to describe? Um, let's, let's say an example, uh, you go through a virtual museum, you can have a painting on the wall, but what if you have a statue, right? Or what if you have, um, like uh, it's not a museum, it's an aquarium and you have a fish that interacts and behaves in certain ways and moves. So like um, at least describe levels of animation, levels of movement, texture, reflection, uh, haptics, um, what, what their behavior is in the interaction with a human uh, in the space. So there's a lot of different layers that we can bring into this. And I, I wanted to have on the end of the discussion, what are the low-hanging fruit? What are the most minimal things that people with uh, visual disabilities would need in order to feel the immersion that a three-dimensional object should bring? Uh, not only a replacement, like an alternative text, but more like a, a feeling of immersion. It's like I have a spatial audio to that object. I have resonance. I can ping things off. If, if I reach out, I touch it, it gives me a sound. Uh, so that kind of giving uh, the feeling that maintain, maintenance of immersion when you're in VR space. That is really important, uh, especially because we're using 3D objects um, to, for in, in social virtual environments for educational purposes, for demonstrational purposes, for like bringing something into a space 
to experience. Right, so these are my thoughts there. Great, thank you. Thanks. And I mean, that's also why we want to have these discussions here. I mean, one of the challenges just right off the bat about thinking about these objects, thinking about you know the weight of an object, the height of an object, the texture of an object, how do we potentially provide that in a mechanism where it's not listening to a screen reader read you know a list of these attributes and it's a long um, you know cacophony of information like what's what are like ideas to explore there for you know elegant ways to do that and you know innovative ways to do that or maybe on request so that's definitely something we want to also hear from it and we get into the q a section all right i'm going to go quickly now through a few more slides um, we wanted to also talk about in addition to objects basically if you host an event inside of any virtual reality platform, you're generally starting from choosing a environment where you want people to come meet you um, for your event. And so naming a room and describing it is also one of the areas that we think, you know, is kind of critical to talk about as a core scenario for this topic. So in this example, um, I'm using a room called empty space that came from Mozilla Hubs. And then I added a description. This room contains a large open space comprising a grassy plain surrounded by mountains. Um, and again, same kind of conversations here, but this idea that when you come into some of the spaces, you may need more orientation information um, than others. And I'll show some examples of that. Um, we also wanted to talk about naming and describing your avatar. So the three things that I think are kind of core, <clears throat> at least from the start, on going into these XR descriptions are we have objects we can bring into the world, we have environments or rooms that we can describe, and then we also have our avatar or how when we join, quote unquote, physically into the room, we're joining as an avatar. And sometimes people join as an avatar that uses a photo of themselves. And so the avatar looks like them. Sometimes they join as something that looks totally different. And so in this example uh, on the screen, I'm showing a panda avatar uh, that can be selected uh, in the Hubs UI. But when you met someone inside of Hubs, for example, if you could not see what their avatar uh, was set up as, it's kind of the same example is the 3D object example where um, it might be interesting to, to you to know that, you know, I chose to uh, represent myself as a panda in the room or as a robot. So th the idea here is that we could have name and descriptions for the avatars themselves. And so I'm showing an example. This is also something we added custom into Mozilla Hubs to say that you could add a description such as simple black and white texture with the eyes and ears emphasized in black. So I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely gonna put myself forward as not someone that's great at writing descriptions for avatars, but I think what we think is that it, every avatar should at least have a default name and description created. And then when you select the avatar, you should be able to customize that and or you know, provide something that maybe you're more comfortable with for that information. So again, that's also a discussion point, but um, sort of core pieces, well, we don't want to have nothing there, right? Like you want to know also if you're selecting it for yourself uh, and you're someone who can't see the image, it's like, well, I do want to have a choice in like how my avatar looks. And so getting enough information to be like, yeah, that's the avatar that I want to choose. Uh, you know, we also think is an important scenario for consideration. All right, I'm going to keep moving here. Um, and then the last part, the last part of the presentation is like figuring out how we label and get into environments and navigate spaces. And so this is, um, I guess, just to put that out there, I, I love the idea on the web of you can have a complex website and have headings and landmarks. And again, these are concepts that exist in ARIA. And I think headings and landmarks also can be useful inside of 3D spaces, at least from the personal opinion. But the idea being that some rooms are a single room 
but then there are certain landmarks inside of the room that are important. And in this screenshot I'm showing, uh, this is something that came up in discussions in our XR access group. We had considerations about figuring out where the stage is and then where the microphone is for audience particip uh, participation. And so the stage is generally where the presenter or the hosts go to speak in virtual rooms. And so for someone who needs to be able to get to the stage and potentially can't see the stage, uh, it needs to be labeled and we need to have a mechanism to navigate to the stage. And so I think it's a very simple one. Another scenario though, is also that in some rooms I've seen microphones be placed in a certain location in the room and people tell attendees please walk up to the microphone and, and stand in line to ask your question. So we also thought that's a good one to work on with this group is to think about that idea. It's different from being in like a Zoom like we are now where we have the raise hand metaphor and maybe it's something that we need to figure out um, in XR if that metaphor gets used in spaces where you're supposed to be able to move to a microphone object and then place yourself in line. Uh, and again, I just put that out there. I'm trying to make these scenarios be real world. And these are things that I've seen happen uh, in XR when I've been using it. Um, this is some functionality that we also added into hubs. And again, we're so happy to have uh, many screen reader users and, and low vision users here that who may use screen readers to, to know about um, how these could work. We sort of openly acknowledge that the first implementation we did with our, our intern is somewhat geeky, quote unquote, like you need to write command line codes to try this out. But we wanted to do that to sort of expedite being able to test with people who could benefit from this. And we want to then figure out how could you make this more intuitive. Um, so on the screen, I'm showing a command called list objects. So in Mozilla chat with our prototype, you can type slash list O, and you can get a list of elements or objects that exist in the room. So the screenshot says this room has the following objects. One, social, role label. Two, stage, role label. Three, microphone, role label. Four, hub instructions. So we have four objects that are placed around the room. When you run this command, you can figure out there's four places to potentially do something with. We also have the uh, command called FOV which in VR or I guess maybe in other areas means field of view, but we were doing field of view to mean that your avatar, if you were looking at what your avatar can see, it's going to be less objects. So FOVO in the screenshot that I have, there's only two things that can be seen when you type FOVO. So there's two, you can see the stage label and three, you can see the microphone label. So that's the idea to go from objects in certain rooms could be in the number of 50 to 100, but objects that are in your field of view um, can be a much smaller list. Um, and so that's an idea that I think is important to consider that you know proximity and where you are in a room and, and what should be described has to be something important, you know, sort of like when you navigate by heading and move into an area of a web page you may only want to hear about things that are within the context of that heading, um, some kind of idea related to that. Um, last scenario before we get into the q and I want to just shout out to Christian Van Muers, who's a senior 3D artist at Mozilla. Um, he built a world called Hubs School uh, version 1.0. And I liked this. Uh, we wanted to keep this discussion kind of in a business slash education scenario. And so this world is actually a really good one to explore in Mozilla Hubs. Um, this world is more of a, um, I'd say grade school, middle school scenario where you have uh, a hallways, you have classrooms and you have lockers, um, you know, where you would be storing your books and backpack between classes. But you can easily imagine this to be like, what if this was XR access and you know we're in a breakout room four and there's like eight breakout rooms, can't remember how many there are, but this is an idea that can really work uh, for a lot of things. And so this 
this environment actually starts with uh, this idea, you're going to the first day of school and it's in virtual reality. And so you could also say you're going to your first uh, conference and it's in virtual reality. Um, what are you gonna wear, right? So what are you gonna wear goes to like, how do you want your avatar to look? What are you going to um, position? And so that goes back to what was shown earlier that we should have a way to describe our options. And, you know, again, it gets complex because some platforms you can have tons of options and other platforms you might have like 12 options to choose from, but all of these things should be possible, right, to customize. Um, and then this is more importantly, like your first class of the day is English. How are you going to find it? And you can also translate to this conference. You wanted to come to this breakout room in Zoom. How are you going to find it? Um, so this is, I think, an interesting metaphor to take into XR worlds. It's like you're coming into any world and the world might be more complicated than just a single huge room. Like our Zoom has multiple breakout rooms. So how are you going to find the breakout room you want to join in XR? So this screenshot shows an overhead view of uh, the VR school uh, that was built. And in the overhead view, we can see there's four regions, I would maybe argue four landmarks um, or four headings, but there's a hallway um, that connects all of the different rooms. And then there are three classrooms um, that have different seating arrangements. And then there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, there's five breakout rooms that exist in this school. So that's something going back to how do you describe an environment before someone joins it? Maybe knowing, right, like when you come into a room, maybe it's important to say you're joining an environment that has three classrooms, five breakout rooms, and a long hallway that connects all of them. Just to put it out there, you know, try to take a real example that's already been built for our discussion. So I wanted to uh, put that out there, and then I wanted to zoom into a specific room. So inside of the first room, we could call it room one or we could maybe call it more appropriately English class or English room. Uh, the English room has four tables. So inside of that room, it's sort of like the headings idea is what I think of, of like breaking down the structure um, to navigate efficiently. If you go to room one, you figure out that it's the English room and then you figure out there's four tables and maybe you wanted to meet a specific person to meet up with in that room. Um, this shows that each table has eight seats. And so inside of XR, or inside of hubs, you can actually select each of these individual seats to sit at. And so on the screen, I'm showing that uh, it's a square table and there are two seats on each, you know, line of the square. So, you know, one and two could be on the north side of the square, three and four could be on the east side of the square, uh, five and six could be on the south side and seven and eight could be on the west side. And so these are all potentially open, right? But then maybe someone's sitting in that seat and maybe you wanna discover who's sitting in that seat, same way like when you go to school, I wanna sit with my friend. Uh, so I like this idea just to think about the orientation of these objects in the room and the fact, uh, as Roland mentioned, knowing that a seat's interactive and that you can sit into it is, an important attribute of that object. Like a lot of the other objects in the room you can't sit on, but the seats um, actually have interactivity. And when you click on them, you, your avatar actually moves and like physically uh, is seated at that seat. And then this is showing a quick screen view of designing the world. And again, it's where I wanna just push on it's really unfortunate and what I wanna change is that you basically, when you design the world, and, and this is a program called Spoke from Mozilla. So Mozilla lets you create this classroom or create this room. Uh, you basically have to label all the objects to make it make sense for you as a developer setting all this up. So on the screen, I'm showing selecting the four different table groups um, because this room did have four different square tables that we could sit at. And then when you go into the table, there's actually uh, inside of the table, there are these different chairs. And so these don't have great accessible labels. They're labeled classroom underscore room, one table, desk, 
dot glb1 classroom underscore room one kid chair dot glb24 you know there's a lot of you know so they're not greatly labeled but i wanted to show this example to show that when developers build this they are actually very similar to building like an html dom you have to do the same thing in xr to like construct the world so if we had the ability to add labels and descriptions and information i i just think it's so close to being there it's just that we don't have these um, tool makers um, enabling that and um, last part just to say is that this is a github project everything i've talked about if uh, you were interested in what I was talking about. We do have this on GitHub and we are continuing the work on this project. And we also are definitely looking for people to come in and try out what's currently built. And also just know that if you are a developer, you can contribute to this. It's all published on GitHub and uh, we are creating a way for people to submit uh, their own changes to it. And with that, I'd like to say thanks for listening to my part of this presentation. And I'm going to now hand it over to Roland to facilitate just like doing a Q&A and also, you know, referring back to anything we discussed in these slides and also new topics that may be of interest to you. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, so um, I'd like to just really quickly add to the presentation what we just saw, the, like choosing the scene and choosing the environment obviously is a big part of like predefining if a space is accessible or not. Uh, if you have a classroom environment with hallways with different rooms um, and, and no guiding system uh, for people that have maybe difficulty navigating the space in the first place, it's much different than having an open, big open space where you look in every direction and then with a guided field of view, read out what objects are in, in the field of view. Like can you can basically advance to go closer to that object when it's nested and uh, like boxed in into different kind of rooms. It, it makes sense because you can have different areas of interest. Let's say the English room is where you learn English. The biology room is where you learn biology. And um, having sectioned off those areas will make it easier for people to focus on a certain part of content because with the spatial audio in the virtual environment, you'll hear everything everywhere if it's not sectioned off and dedicated in a certain space. So um, yeah, so what, what, uh, what we created with the tags and the guide, like the finding the spaces with labels will help guiding and giving people a chance to jump to certain areas of interest um, with short codes. And again, those short codes are actually very much aligned with how Mozilla Hubs works right now. So you can basically turn off gravity or uh, turn on gravity also with the short code slash G. So there's a lot of, uh, like we, we stayed within that language in order to make those features accessible. And I hoping down the line, we'll just have short codes or something like that in Mozilla Hubs that make this less of a uh, geeky kind of input. Um, yeah, having having said that, like um, guiding people to locations, obscuring or like focusing on areas that are within the field of view or having people navigate three dimensions and uh, turning around and looking at objects, describing the objects. Um, so my, my uh, I just wanted to open up the floor here for anyone that has any kind of thoughts or feedback about what they've seen so far, um, where do you, where they see uh, like there's opportunity to dive deeper in, uh, like dig deeper or explore more. And uh, also I want to hear about missed opportunities, uh, especially for people that are, are here, joined us with uh, any visual disability. So any kind of people that know very deeply uh, in that space, uh, people that are struggling with certain things. Uh, I'd love to, to hear about that. Uh, and yeah, so I see Andy is raising his hand. So please go ahead, unmute and share your thoughts. Hey everybody, uh, this is Andy. Um, I may have missed this, but I didn't, I, I don't think I heard any mention of the ability to maybe place um, audio beacons on points of interest, like the, um, the example of maybe going up to 
a microphone to ask Q and you know for Q and A in a in a in a Mozilla space. Um, you know, thinking that just like if you're familiar with um, Microsoft Soundscape or Seeing AI or anything where you can just kind of drop a a, a beacon or a, you know a ping sound or something like that at, at a point of interest or someplace you want to save. Um, is that a possibility? Is that part of this discussion where you know a user can just you know toggle on and off, maybe even like go through a menu of you know the POIs in the space and then you know follow that beacon as opposed to maybe just transporting directly so that you get to you know experience the environment and the trip there? I definitely think this is a very important point. Yeah. So I know in Spoke, you can create points of interest, like, like, like the seats in the room on the classroom where you can snap to it. That is a, a, a pointer that you can select as an object. Like pairing that with an audio uh, would be amazing. Um, now the question is like do you think there'd be opportunity to have like to record snippets of voice so i said i want to create an audio description of an object that then maybe will be later transcribed into text captions or would you just think about a beacon as like a ping or what what you hear in like crossing the street the bird sounds when you can get green lights what, what do you yeah. think about that i mean i'm just thinking about you know, whoever creates the space um, selects just a short sound, or maybe there's something in, you know, in Mozilla that's, you know, like just a standard sort of like, yeah, beep or a UI sound or something like that. And then maybe somebody can customize it, just have a short little MP3, you know, that, that loops and then is spatialized. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the user or the, the visitor can just like you're saying, like maybe type in a short code to go to one or the other, you know, and there's a description, you know, um, you know, inside the room description, there's these sort of, you know, rules and, and or, you know, like um, actions and, and, and instructions on how to get there. So, I mean, you know, I think like adding a voice might, you know, confuse, like, I think having like a non-verbal mm -hmm. um, clip might, be cleaner for the environment if other people are talking or have mics on or something like that right, so right. yeah just like you know a beep or a ping just like in soundscape or something that you know like that um i know that you can do that in was it spatial i think you can add like audio and then i think in like um i, I don't know other things that i've tried that, I, that i've tried out i don't remember the name sorry about that but yeah i mean i don't know that's that's some place or that's something that could be really fun and you could create games and you could do all other kinds of stuff. I think this is great feedback and I, I love the idea. So like, I want to dig a little deeper. Do you think it would be of value to have uh, a library of pings that are predefined as, uh, let's say, um, this is a ping for a location that is a point of interest. This is a ping of an object that um, you have to find or like, are there, is there like, would there be some kind of similar to like hover states on buttons in like normal CSS, right? Like focus, pressed, selected, um, that kind of stuff. Like there's a certain amount of different kind of pings that are distinctive and could be normalized and um, like agreed on as being a certain sound for a certain purpose. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of different uses. Um, and situations where you could, you know, use that stuff. You can even, even like a friend, you know, who you know is in there and you're not able to find, like they could even maybe send you a personal uh, ping or something like that. So yeah, if you had a library, um, you know, just if you just treated it like different emojis, you know, like they have their functions and then like different sound, uh, you know, beacons or, you know, little, you know, uh, you know, sounds and stuff would have their own definition um you know i mean you could play around with it you can get creative you can do all, all kinds of stuff but it's something that i'm always very interested in uh, i'm not sure what anybody else uh anybody else has any thoughts on it yeah no thank you so much andy this is great feedback um and i also wanted to just maybe float the idea that we may have to look into making sounds only hearable by people that select to hear that, because if you want to have a ping that is selective for a certain friend, that um, uh, and ten people do that, that might be, get really confusing really quickly. So I think that maybe we'll have a, a target person to hear something, 
when you select a certain sound or you know a category a group of people that you want to listen to a certain certain like audio cues um that that might be an option in order to keep keep the the focus um but it's just floating it out there very cool okay so let's go to joanne please hi my name is joanne lastor um and i love the, the ping idea Maybe you could, for navigation, just have, um, just like they have an audio description track, you know, so you could essentially turn on the navigation track or turn it off. Um, I was going to ask what I hope is really not a stupid question, but how does field of view translate for someone who can't see? That's a very good question. How do they know what their field of view is? Yeah, so, yeah. Thanks, Joanne. This is a really good question. And um, <clears throat> like we like the standard field of view is 60 degrees. I mean, that's comes from that like Google Cardboard lens, which <laughs> defined the very first version of uh, VR. So it is a, I mean, it's not anywhere close to real human field of view because peripheral vision is not being considered in this case. But um, in order to like even rotation in most social uh, VR environments, uh, like uh, 45 degree rotation, so you can keep a point of continuity when you rotate. So you don't just switch 90 to 90 or 90 degrees in four directions. So 60 degree is like between 45 and 60 degrees, the field of view. And the focus here is uh, that you limit that lens to, to, a, to an amount that um, gives you a, a certain focus and doesn't exclude too much so that you're not in uh, like shouting into the void and don't get any feedback. So, and, and that's, that's where we were thinking of field of view should be a range in. Um, it, does that make sense? Yeah, I just want to add to that. I think we're also doing like depth of perception in this as well, but we didn't say that. But depth of perception is another idea, right? Like that, okay, in my field of view, in a large room, my depth of perception, we were going for like proximity in the the closest objects. And, you know, again, just going from like sonically listening to objects that also has to be a factor where there may be a command to say, no, I really want everything, you know, in this field of view, but then also we did make an assumption. I think we were doing like five to 10 meters. Um, and that's just, uh, we didn't mention that, but I think since you brought that up for getting to the definitions, I just thought it'd be good to add that. So we actually kind of need like a sonic point of view um, as well as a, a you know, a field of, of view. Um, that's interesting. Thank you. Yes, that sounds um, exactly right. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for jumping in there. Um, let's um, let's go to Brandon. Hey. Um, so I'm curious, uh, Roland or Thomas, if either of you have played any audio games. Like you mean iPhone audio games? No, I mean like Swamp or a Hero's Call or any of these like first person shooters or virtual reality audio, audio only experiences. I have heard of them, have not yet gotten a chance to play with them. They pretty much solved most of these issues that you guys have been bringing up around like, you know, field of view, uh, navigation around between you know classrooms and, um, and through the hallways, uh, how to name objects, collision detection, uh, you know all that kind of stuff. So like, uh, for example, in um, Swamp uh, and Beacons as well. Um, so for example, in Swamp, which is a first person experience, uh, they allow the user to, you're basically a little avatar and you run around a world and you shoot zombies. Um, and you can like have clans with other players and stuff like that. Um, and it's all non-visual, so you don't need, you know, it's all, all done in audio. And so, um, uh, you know, with, with this um, interface, you're basically a, a little avatar um, and, and you have a, an auditory field of view that uh, I think is, um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how long it is, but I think it's like 50 points or something like that um, away from the user, 50 steps. Uh, and um, 
you can uh, when when you're navigating around, you have different tools that can help you like determine what's in front of you or not. But most of the time, people just like run into walls because uh, that's a much more efficient way of moving um, than uh, actually trying to avoid walls. So um, a lot of people uh, don't use any of the helper um, tools that they they provide. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, I, I would just recommend looking at some of those. I posted the link in the in the Slack channel. I, um, I appreciate that. Really That'd be great. Kind of stuff. <laughs> um, I, so Swamp is um, with the the. Um, I, th I think I found them. Uh, but yeah, if we can get a list of this. I, I think that'd be great. Like we, we'd love to build a list of. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be publishing a paper here in the next oh. uh, probably six months or so. No, three three months, six months, depending on how long it takes the paper to get published. Um, on uh, we're we're analyzing the top uh like 50 audio games with all of these different types of conventions. So like scan, uh, beacon detection, navigation, target detection, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um. And we're kind of breaking it out into uh, different categories. Um, I'd love to get your feedback on like what um, we're, we're just getting started. So I'm going to post a a, um, a Google Doc uh, link in the Slack chat, um, and I'd love to know if we're missing any areas that you're interested in uh, for us to analyze from these different audio games. I, I totally love that. This is amazing. Um, I do have a follow up question here. So in these games, is there it is, it's a first-person shooter um, and probably non-person uh, non uh, characters, like the zombies are not other yeah. players. Yeah, zombies uh, are non-player player characters. The guards are non-player characters. There's a bunch of non-player characters, are there, yeah. Are, are there examples in that where you play with other players? Um, like yes, for sure. You can have clans and you can go attack the zombies in teams. There's capture the flag. I think there might be some PVP. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't played in a while, but um, there's definitely you go on these missions with other players where you have to like collect uh, crates um, in a warehouse, and uh, it's it's like we, we the, the the audio game community has really gone to the same level of almost the same level of interaction, I'd say, as the visual VR community because we've had it for about 20 years, whereas visual virtual reality really hasn't taken off um it's kind of fairly new so there's a lot of really complex uh some um uh, inter interactions that have been developed in these audio games uh so like a follow-up question on that do you know any of uh those games doing uh, a cross collaboration with the visual community and yeah the so swamp community? for example has a visual interface for the um the sighted users that for some reason want visuals, but it's completely playable non-visually. Most of the players are blind. Okay, so that's exactly solving the problems that we're trying to solve because it's inclusion yeah. equity, right? Because we have this heavy, heavy uh, focus on visual. So we want to make sure we bring that layer. I, I wouldn't say they're like amazing graphics because it's the, the, the developer, um, although the developer for that one particular game, Swamp, is sighted. Um, you know, he's not an artist, so and he doesn't have a budget for artists um, to, to make his game super good um, visually, but the, uh, they're, they're, they're okay enough to actually play because he plays it visually, and then he's built this interface for blind users. Awesome. Well, th thank you so much for this, and I'm looking forward to your paper. And, and... I posted a link to a, um, an abst extended abstract I wrote on this topic that kind of has the, um, a list of different types of interfaces from audio games. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's uh, move uh, on to Mahfoud, please. Hello. Uh, oh, let me switch on the video. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm a facility consultant, but I'm not a developer. So sorry if I make uh, Silly questions, but just to ensure I understand all. And first, my my first question is: Are you using the area to label the object into space? So area is enough. It is enough to provide accessibility for object in the space, like in the space, like in the web. And uh, the second question, 
is um, okay. Here you indicated how to label object in the space, but I didn't hear anything with this clearly when I'm totally blind. So uh, I don't know if you just saw the code or the result, but uh, since I didn't hear the clear river, I don't know how it read the object. It If the clear river say object or say the kind of the element, microphone, uh, dog or whatever, avatar. And uh, the last question, you uh, talk about the object separately, but uh, in the metaverse, how a blind user can access to that uh, to that object in the in the metaverse? Because I don't know if there are more tools, but right now the only tool I know is alt alt space. However, alt space is not accessible with screen for screen river users. So uh, there are other tools to work uh, with uh, to work to explore this object in the metaverse a part of the video games. All right, so thank you so much for your questions. I'll try to answer the first one uh, and then I'm gonna have Thomas help me with the other two questions. Uh, so the first question, did we use ARIA or is ARIA enough to describe uh, the, the web XR space or like the virtual space on the web? And uh, we've been actually working on this actively, building in ARIA labeling for 3D objects on a framework called A-Frame. Um, so we've been building a few examples where we get screen readers to read out what a canvas, uh, um, a three-dimensional canvas representation of uh, um, based on 3JS so JavaScript library to describe three-dimensional content. Uh, so we have built uh, some examples that use ARIA labeling in order to navigate uh, the, the virtual web. Um, is it enough? I don't know. There is uh, efforts like the accessibility object model that Stephanie can tell you a little bit more about. Uh, and these are efforts from the W3C and the Immersive Web Community Group uh, to contextualize three-dimensional objects and spaces in virtual environments to make it more inclusive and more, more like uh, meta data heavy in order to make this a, a more con a contextual space. Um, the second question, uh, let me try to remember that your second question was about um how can i explore this object oh, yeah. feature with the screen reader? yeah so how did we thomas how how did you test it like with uh with the yeah lens? no i think uh just to be amazing then to get to meet with you after this i mean one of the things that you know i'm proud about with the prototype is that basically we had to make it self-voicing because aria didn't really work as Roland described, I mean, like I wanted to start with like, oh, I hoped it would work. And it does in some limited capacity, but basically the way that it works, and we've tested this with um, NVDA and voiceover, um, those commands that I was describing, and you know, we had to go very fast, but like slash F-O-V-O, when you type that into the chat window, in Mozilla Hubs, it creates an ARIA alert message. And so basically what we, you type the command in and the output that gets displayed visually as text in the chat gets announced immediately in the screen reader um, voiced. So it's not actually following any kind of anything other than we're writing all the text output to the screen reader. The, the good part about that for prototyping and what I think would be cool if we could work with you know, people such as yourself to try it out is that we can at least prototype and then test with people. If I put this command in and I heard this, is this good or bad? So we have that functionality working where you can use the screen reader um, and type the commands in and then hear the output of the window. So we really want to heavily ask you know, anyone interested in that, I think we're, uh, Ren Tyler also here, 
Um, we've been wanting to do this UX study. Um, and so this is an opportunity. If you're interested in that, um, we do have that capability. And yeah, we didn't have that in the demos, but that was a big part of the work we did was to make sure that it would work with just existing screen readers on a desktop interface so that we could at least do user testing and discussion. Yeah, just uh, do you have the sorry uh, okay. some demos? I'll follow with you in a meet in a meet meet up in your group. Do you have uh, so in the video what you have in meet up? Do you have any demo on this? Demo on meet up. We have um, uh, all the meetups that uh, Thomas is making are recorded on YouTube and uh, captioned. So, like, um, Thomas, you re-recorded uh, the last meetup about uh, your uh, your prototype there. So you can definitely follow up on that uh, on YouTube. Um, but I think that uh, the, the the next step would be definitely like to get in touch with you and others that want to be involved in like heavy user testing and making sure that we're building rock solid prototypes to turn into something real. Um, okay. and, and really quickly, I want to add just really fast, we should move to the next question, but the, the testing in the metaverse and the headset, we also do have the ability, I mean, the challenge, especially during COVID was meeting people who are blind and low vision that had the headsets to maybe try this, but we did create an interface, sonic interface for exploring objects and then having like a trigger or button press to hear the description so that's different than using it right like um typing on the computer keyboard and so that that would also be an area of interest like if we can meet people that have access to the headsets uh we do want to get there too so like where you're working wearing the headset and the controllers yes uh, and and just to be candid about that uh, we've been building those prototypes uh and tested it in the quest a lot of the testing, obviously the Quest browser does not have any kind of accessibility features built in. So we basically had to like build in like uh, screen, screen uh, text-to-speech plugins and others to make, to make it do the things that normal screen readers would do. Um, so there's, there's an extra layer of effort for our prototypes to make it inclusive. And what we're really looking forward to actually to play around and, and have them tested. By, by members of uh, the community. All right, um, let's move on to Sriram. Hi, uh, I'm new to VR, so I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to learn about this world. Uh, I do have a fair bit of experience with screen readers and, and magnifiers for low vision people. And one thing I do find interesting is normally when people use software and blind people when they use software, it's a very verb oriented world for them. Take an example of Excel, you know, they operate a bit on data and then they can go to well-known places to do actions. Looks like VR is more of a noun oriented world where you go to objects, you go to people, you then try to do something. Uh, I suspect blind people will find it very disconcerting that they're moving and they're to an object, but they have no idea of what to do with it. So, yeah, and, and also the other part I've noticed is blind people have a very utilitarian view of software. They are there to get things done. And I wonder if this will, uh, uh, I wonder if it makes sense to have, hey, you're at this particular object. There's the list of things you could do that one could consistently get to, you know, using a shotgun. And the second, second part that I, I was thinking about is for low vision users. You know, uh, low vision users typically operated like 6x magnification, and they're often very overwhelmed, you know, uh, yeah, because it causes them. So if you look at you know, low vision computer person usage, computer usage by a low vision person. It's actually really in short bursts of time. You know, they operate for one and a half hours and then they give up because they're overwhelmed by the amount of sort of traveling they have to do within the website, you know. I will, I'm wondering if this will also 
overwhelmed because now you have magnified in a three dimensional world, how overwhelming it is to low vision users and are there, is there any thought given to low vision users means so with that. Yes, thank you so much for those questions are really good. Um, so yes. Um, one of my biggest goals, and I've been on this since 2016, is that I come from an accessibility space that's 2D web, and I found the WebXR space as being like the next medium. And, and the, the, the accessibility goals um, for ADA compliance are to give in 2D websites an equal, like an equal functionality to people that have no vision. That means it is oriented on outcomes. It's not, it's like, like you literally have a semantic website that turns into a piece of text and does the same as a visual website. But in the VR space, we're not selling content, we're selling experiences. We're selling, like, we're creating environments of space, of exploration. We have three dimensions and we have interactions with other human beings within it. So, and that, that's why my, my biggest goal was to preserve immersion and give the sense of presence to people that don't see or have any other physical disability, whether they cannot move. So you give them the tools to navigate. Um, so yes, um, like the goal is to create a communal space and the goal is to bring people into an immersive space where they can belong and navigate and create uh, at the same level and the same quality as people with uh, like um, ever buddies and um, you know the people that are being sold VR at the moment. So um, yeah, so this is a very good point. Uh, I'd like to discuss this further as well, but uh, to get your other uh, uh, point real quick with the people with low vision, there are tools uh, that are currently built in where you have certain cones of visual ability, where you can restrict your peripheral vision, where you can um, focus on certain things that there are built in accessibility tools for that already in existing computer games um, that, that restrict um, the view to like reduce the noise uh, and, and keep focus on like a smaller field of vision um, and, and we do explore those things as well. Um, and there is a bunch of plugins that we've been seeing where people with low vision get increased contrast, uh, get outlines, where things get zoomed in on, on demand. Um, and all of those plugins are basically now like band-aids that you can add on top of your software. They're not really baked in in the original software. Very, very few studios, um, like uh, development studios are going down the line where they can build that into the original version of the software. But yeah, the more we have discussions about this, the more we can show interest in, 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 in like having those solutions built in from the get-go, building more of a universal design into a game experience or software, uh, the more we will see this happen. So yeah, so th there's definitely stuff that's going on in that world. And um, I think Dylan is here as well. He has tons of, exp uh, uh, of uh, samples for this. Um, he, has, uh, he has been doing a lot of research in that space as well. So I'd like, love to uh, connect you with him as well and learn yep, more. I, I do work with Dylan. I have okay. spoken to Dylan. Awesome. One of the things that's very apparent though is that uh, the authoring tools need to support this natively. Yes, the yes. sort of ability yeah. to do markup. Otherwise, you'll never. You could write, you know, the best screen reader and the best consumption tool, but the authoring tools need to produce. You know. I, I ran into uh, some Unity folks at AWE, and I have uh, a meeting with some of their, mo mostly with input, but I'll, I'll definitely ask them about. Hey, how about them? How about them uh, alt text on objects? Right. <laughs> when I get exactly. the chance. <laughs> Yeah, and sure, I'm so like uh, authoring tools is our goal. That's why we're directly working with Mozilla Hubs, uh, Thomas and I, to get mm -hmm. all those features baked into the original software. I mean, it's open source software, and we're in touch with the Mozilla people. And, and I, I think the biggest leap forward can be only done in open source uh, and uh, in the web first, because that's just uh, where the most uh, 
broadest interest and broadest like drive is. So I, I'm sure I'm sure we can do some impact there, and then then it will trickle down to the mainstream and to the to the uh, the you know native <laughs> development world. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Um, I'd like to jump to Lilo uh, because uh, there has been a, a little long uh, the hand up there. So please go ahead, Lilo. Mm -hmm. Just a heads up, we have about three or four minutes before yes. the breakout room will be closed. Yes. Okay, I'll try and go quick. I was just thinking about when we were talking about avatar design or your personal profile, about if it's possible to add your own personal audio, because even some of the really early video games I used to play as a kid, um, sometimes you could choose the sound that your character, like the footsteps that they would make walking around and they would have all these different effects. So I know it's important not to have an overwhelming audio space for um, people by just having all of these sounds on, but I think having customizable audio for the avatars is also really cool because then, you know, they can sound like the person in addition to just looking like them. I think this is a fantastic piece of feedback. Yeah, me too. Um, there is, I mean, like the way that Mozilla Hub's avatars are built, also everything is open source. There's like, you can, you, you should be able to upload textures without text, you know, so that you can describe what the texture is and maybe pairing in there some audio. Maybe when you, if you bring in textures that are actually MP4 files, like with audio inclusion, that would be something interesting too as well. Um, yeah, so... Ne ne next thing on our list to explore, Thomas, right? <laughs> awesome. Um, I think that's great. I do, I do have one last hand up for the last couple of minutes. Shushil, do you want to give it a shot? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I'll do this quick. Uh, Sushil from Verizon. Uh, I'm new to this uh, space for uh, VR, but I uh, had a quick question. How do you trigger the screen reader on, on uh, especially on Oculus Quest 2? Uh, what is the easiest way to do that? Uh, any hints or do I need to have uh, an air link uh, tethered with the computer to get the best experience with the screen reader? Well, my opinion right now, unfortunately, like you basically have to be self voicing, you know, and self voicing, you have to like, actually implement, in, it's not a lot of code, you know, so the, the positive is that um, if you know how a screen reader functions, and you just create some methods to do this, you can run the equivalent of, you know, speech synthesizer speak, insert text, uh, that will work on the quest, but you know, you basically to do web, you know, we've struggled with like, how do you get that to be done in a way that you don't have to run an assistive technology? I, I want it to work with like JAWS and VDA. There aren't any screen readers running on the headsets as far as I know of to date, other than narrator on like HoloLens, you can sort of do a few things if you do a narrator thing. But I think right now you'd be best served keeping functions really simple, but like do speech, you know, use one of the speech synthesizers to output screen reader text. And you, you, you have to basically create the screen reader in your app right now. And hopefully that changes. So. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your last question. You're just in time. So we'll be joining yeah. back uh, the main room in like 50 seconds. Thank you everyone so much for all your yeah. great questions and your feedback. And I hope you all reach out to us. The slide deck will be shared. And uh, we'll be, um, yeah, we'll be looking forward to hearing from all of you. And if you want to uh, um, help us with uh, testing our prototypes, uh, be involved in, in giving us feedback, how that works for you, uh, we'll be glad and we'll be really uh, like humble to be part, uh, have you part of this. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.